Good morning. Good to see you on this second Sunday of Advent, uh, this most special season of the year. It's great to have you with us here for worship. Those of you here with us in person, person, great to see you on this beautiful Sunday morning. And those of us who are joining online through our live stream broadcast or later watching the video later, uh, we really appreciate your being with us as well. As we move forward through this season of great preparation, welcome. Uh, let me make several notes as we prepare to worship today. First of all, this afternoon, at two o'clock in the afternoon, we'll have our family Advent uh, celebration with all kinds of children's ministry crafts and other activities. Ashley will probably say something more about that in a few minutes, but wanna remind you all of that. It'll be a beautiful afternoon at Robinson Lake today as our Sunday uh, celebrations continue. I wanna thank all of you who love Palmer Home for Children and therefore, as part of your special support, above and beyond your regular tithes and offerings, um, gave towards the poinsettia uh, provision through Palmer Home for this year. Thank you so much. Uh, your response was very faithful. I really appreciate you for loving Palmer Home and for really the beautiful poinsettias we have all around the sanctuary and some downstairs too. Um, Thanks so much for participating. I wanna encourage you, particularly if you participated to support this special mission cause, to pick up uh, one of the booklets. Olivia did a great job on the booklet uh, with all the names and recognitions, the uh, memorial gifts and the honoraria gifts, uh, and, and also recognition of why we do this for Palmer Home. So thank you so much. Speaking of uh, turning in cards and putting the Lord first in your life. I wanna remind you, if you have not yet had the opportunity uh, to turn in your bicentennial year celebration pledge cards, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and do that as soon as possible. We need your help as we plan for the new year, most certainly uh, for your commitment to regular worship, uh, not only on the Lord's Day morning, but also through the week. A card for that, your card for service, mentioned that and highlighted that last Sunday. And then, as well, your commitment to bring God's tithe in your further offerings. Please turn in your pledge cards. Uh, you know, I love the pledge cards for this year. Highlighting, you've seen the photos, right, that we pulled for these cards as we move into what is our bicentennial year. It's a big year to celebrate, a lot bigger than anything like COVID. You know what? We survived the pandemic of 1919, 19. 18, 19, 20, we survived all those years and, and all the, the concerns with health and the deaths that uh, we incurred as a church family. And God has sustained us yet and will sustain us into this new year. I trust in that. But I, I particularly love speaking of uh, the worshiping God commitment, uh, this picture of our old sanctuary, right? The former sanctuary before this one, uh, back from 1911. And uh, I wanna encourage you to turn in those pledge cards if you would, go ahead and get those in. If you have not yet picked up or seen a copy of the December newsletter, uh, we have printed copies available in the entrance areas. If you wanna have an extra one, if you already have one, but it'd be great to hand one to a friend and invite them to our church uh, or tell them about our good news that we share here, pick up an extra copy, uh, get it to a friend or neighbor. This Wednesday, our final Wednesday night Bible study uh, for this year, 5.30 in the fellowship hall, or you may join me by Zoom. Those of you who are watching online, you'll probably wanna join by Zoom, but I wanna encourage those of you can be with me in person as well to be with us downstairs in the fellowship hall, 5.30 this Wednesday. And now, uh, Reed and Madeline Robertson are going to open us in worship with our call to worship, including the lighting of the second Advent candle. Centuries before Jesus was born, the Lord, Israel's God, spoke through the prophet Haggai, saying, And I will shake all nations, so that the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory. Jesus' coming fulfilled that prophecy in those gospel promises we read in Haggai. As we light the second Advent candle on the Advent wreath, we remember the Christmas gift God gave to the prophets Simeon and Anna. Each of those very old, very faithful Jews 
rejoiced in seeing baby Jesus' arrival in the temple in Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph, Joseph presented him as their firstborn son, making offerings and dedicating Jesus unto the Lord. Luke chapter 2 introduces Simeon before he sees Jesus by saying Simeon had waited his whole life for the consolation of Israel. That is, he had been waiting his whole life to see the Messiah, Jesus, consolation of Israel. Later, describing Anna's joy upon seeing Jesus, Luke writes, And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and began to speak of Jesus to all of those who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Please pray with us. O oh, Jesus, you were and are the true answer to all the promises about Israel's Messiah and about, a God coming, and about God's coming to bring salvation to all nations. O oh, joy of every longing heart, please redeem us and give us new hearts that are alive in your Holy Spirit. Unite us with yourself, your church, and your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. Now as you remain seated, would you sing with us, O oh, Come, thou long expected Jesus. Good morning. Um, so I was thinking we've been decorating. I should say Jeremy. He is a decorator of my house. We He has been decorating our house this weekend for Christmas. And I started thinking about Christmas and Christmas morning in my family. And one thing that I remember is waking up on Christmas morning so excited about opening presents. And my, um, my mom has three sisters and my dad has a sister and my grandparents. We all lived very, fairly close together. So my sister and I would wake up and we would go open presents. And then we would call my granddaddy and my grandmama. And they'd come over and see what we had. Then we'd go to their house and open presents. And so when I got older, I, I realized what the last event was on that day to open presents. And I remember thinking toward the end of the day, man, I only have you know, two more events to get presents and open them. Man, at the, at the end of the day, this is the last, the last time I'm gonna open gifts. And I remember one time I was kinda, I was younger, and I remember telling my dad, man, this is it, I only have one more time to open presents. And he looked at me, he said, whoa, 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 let's, let's talk. We're really going to get upset because we're finished opening presents. 
And I said, yeah, you know, I didn't even think about it. And he said, well, that's on me. Let's talk about the present that we get that's going to last a lot longer than one day. And I will never forget him saying that. And I'm sure at the time I was like, oh, you're right, Dad, you're right. Now let me go open some more presents. But I will never forget that. So this morning, I am going to read James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So this morning is kind of for the kids, but it's also for the adults. And I am speaking to myself and for myself and for my family. Um, the presents are amazing and they're fun. And you will hear me tell kids this entire season, there is nothing wrong with wanting to get something from family. Now, I hope that you want to get other people gifts as well. But it's exciting to get gifts. But as parents, we need to teach our kids that the greatest gift we can receive is baby Jesus that morning. And that he continues giving all year. So... Again, parents, let's remember to share that with our kids. Ashley, I'm talking to myself. And kids, let's remember, these toys are great. But I can guarantee you, within a week, you're going to be done with most of those toys. But the gift of the Lord and the gift of family and the gift of salvation will always be here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, God. And thank you um, for this joyous season, Lord. And please help us uh, to make it about others and God, not to just make it about ourselves. Um, please help us to know the greatest gift ever given, the gift of Jesus. Help us to discuss it with our families, discuss it with others, and um, to make sure that our children know that Christmas Day, yes, it's a fun day, but Lord, it, it's a day that continues through the entire year. Please forgive us when we fail you, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we affirm our faith from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 5. How does God work out his providence in the world and in our lives? God uses ordinary means to work out his providence day by day. But as he pleases, God may work without, beyond or contrary to ordinary means in order to work out his providence. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Sovereign Lord, we rejoice in your majesty and in your majestic holy rule. Lord, we come before you. We bow in your presence. And by your grace, we join with the heavenly host in awe-filled praise and wonder. Holy, holy, holy are you. Everlasting, beautiful, holy, righteous, true God. O oh Lord, we, we praise your name. And we give all thanks to you for all good gifts. As Ashley has shared your word with us, indeed, all good gifts come from above from you. And Lord, as we reflect upon the gifts of our lives, Lord, those of us who are blessed to have families and children and grandchildren, those of us who are blessed to have the opportunity to come together in worship, whether in person here or through, Lord, the provision of technological connection in this age in which we live. To have the freedom to believe openly. Lord, we give thanks for all these things. Lord, we also, as we come before you in this season of preparation, not only for the great celebration of your first coming, but in anticipation and preparation for your ultimate return, we confess our sin before you. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you will continue to do the work of your Holy Spirit within us. O oh, come, Holy Spirit, change our hearts, O oh God, 
renew us in the joy of our salvation in you. Nothing else even begins to compare, O Lord, to the gift of salvation that you give us. O Lord, call us from sin and from sinful distractions to know the joy of salvation in you, O Lord. And we pray for that in this season. Lord, we pray that uh, as we do decorate our homes and as we do think about the coming of Christmas, Lord, that we might put off and put out things in our lives that have crept in over the course of 2020 that are not of you. And Lord, most centrally, that we might turn from fear and our own lust and immediate pleasure-seeking turn to you as the gift, as the love of our lives. And we pray for that now, O Lord. We come before you, Lord, we pray for your continued inspiration, Lord, of medical and scientific researchers. We give thanks for all the doctors and nurses serving among us, including some who are with us right here in worship right now, Lord. Sustain them as they serve faithfully, day to day and week to week. And Lord, we pray for breakthroughs and continued advances. Lord, that this might be a glory to you, that even people who do not believe might have their hearts and souls and eyes awakened, that you are the one. No, no political party, uh, no human being brings about healing, that you are the one who brings about the timing and the perfection of healing. So we turn to you and we ask that for our nation and for the world right now, not only with respect to COVID-19, but oh, so much more deeply, Lord, with respect to the sin that destroys and brings death. Lord, we, we pray for those who need your help right now. We pray for those who are grieving loss. We pray for those who are at home recovering from surgery. We continue to lift up Emily and others, Lord, and be with them. We come before you this day, Lord, and we pray in the way you teach us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, believe the good news. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sin from us in Jesus Christ. Um, as we move through this season, I do want to give thanks for those of you who have so faithfully brought your bicentennial year pledges. Uh, we, we look to the Lord, and as the theme of this coming year reminds us, God calls us to be faithful to our foundation all the way back to 1821 and to our future in 2021 and beyond. Amen. Now, along those lines, I want to give thanks for those of you who are our faithful stewards. And, and we have so many things that we've been celebrating this fall. We'll continue in this uh, Advent season as well. Today, we have a video uh, from one of our mission partners. This is from our mission partner, Mission India. As many of you know, and as I kind of try to keep you apprised of, we have supported over the last several years, uh, at, at this point, over 10 uh, church planters that are at work in India, in various parts of India, including several who are in anti-conversion states, which means they're putting their lives on the line to bring the Christian gospel and to develop new churches. Um, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but through your faithfulness, we now have made a commitment as we close out this year and move into the new year to support 10, 10, believe it or not, 10 uh, Bible clubs in the state of Bihar in northeastern India uh, that will reach hundreds of children who do not know about Jesus, whose families do not know about Jesus. And for the next year, five days a week, they will be in Bible literacy clubs. These are children ages from about six through 16. 
And, and, and typically with these clubs, several children and several families come to Christian faith through this outreach. They learn to read with the Bible. In addition, uh, you are now committed to support to the training of two new church planters in the state of Gujarat over, you know, over to the west, okay? So you're covering different parts of India. This is an update. Why Mission India? Why help Mission India? Here's our video that we're sharing with you today. For 2,000 years, we have had some very good news to share. The good news that originated with one man, the Son of Man, and has been changing lives ever since. Out of the 7 billion people on our planet, nearly one third of us have heard and embraced the good news of the gospel message. We know Jesus and call him Lord. Another third have heard this good news, but have not responded to it. Some have simply ignored it. Some have rejected it. And then there are those who have never heard it. Two billion people living in places where no missionary has set foot, speaking languages in which no scripture is available, listening, but having no opportunity to respond to this good news. More than 400 million of these people live in just one country, my country, India. Many are held down by illiteracy. One in four Indians cannot read or write. Many are locked in poverty. Nearly 300 million people live on less than $2 a day. Our children face incredible injustice. Half of those who start school don't complete it. Many worship silent idols, believe in black magic, and their lives are governed by the caste system. These are the tools of the deceiver to lay claim to India's unreached people. But the people of God are also here. We come from many different walks of life, from every corner of this great nation. We are diverse, but share the same vision to see India transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. We have dedicated our lives to this. We have invested our blood, sweat and tears to bringing Jesus where his name is not at known. We will not stop until we have reached every unreached place. And when you join with Mission India, you're partnering with us. Together we will replace fear with hope. Together we will turn tears into laughter. Together we will shine light into dark places because this is our calling. This is our mission. Our mission is India. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, you said, let there be light. And there was light. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. O oh Lord, as we are awed by your work throughout the states and so many places in the nation of India, and we're awed and humbled, Lord, that you would call us, Lord, simple tithers and givers in this church family to be partners in this good news miracle and revolution that you're bringing about in other parts of the world. Open our hearts, O Lord, now to your word that we might love you 
live in your love and never be the same. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For this second Sunday of Advent, we are going to be turning to two main scriptures for our message today. The message today is nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. I want to invite you to go ahead and say that with me at the beginning here. Nothing's impossible with God. And I want to invite you, and I want to invite those of you who are watching with us on our broadcast to believe that good news today. We're going to be turning to two scriptures. We'll open with Genesis chapter 18, verses 13 through 14. And then later on, we'll, we'll work our way through some of the verses of what's known as the Annunciation passage of Luke chapter 1. Today, we're going to be looking at Luke 1, 30 through 37, and truth be told, I'll go ahead and include a little bit from verse 26 of Luke 1 as well. Really going to be focusing on verse 37 today, but we'll, we'll get to that passage later, and we will return in a couple Sundays to the Annunciation again. We're focusing on the Annunciation for the central Sundays of the Advent season. As I said, we're going to begin now with Genesis 18, 13 through 14. This is during the famous visitation, the Advent, the coming of the Lord uh, to Abraham um, as Abraham sat outside his tent at the uh, oaks of Mamre. Abraham's an old man now. He's in the promised land, but he's not kind of having the life and the fruit that was expected earlier. Uh, and so just picking up on this story, the visitation of the Lord. Verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord, for Jehovah, for Yahweh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really bear a child when I'm old? In other words, this old? <laughs> it's no wonder that Sarah was incredulous. You got to remember the background. When Abram and Sarah E were already, you know, pretty old, like in middle age and moving on up there, um, the Lord continued to lay his call on Abram to leave his father, his father's household. Um, and not just the Chaldean household, but the, the newer household in Haran. And to, to, to just take off to somewhere that God promised to show Abram. Abram didn't know, but the Lord started making these promises about, uh, you know, ultimately, centrally about how all the nations would be blessed through the seed, through the offspring of this man, Abram. Problem was, he didn't have any children yet, and he certainly didn't have a big family. How, how's the entire world going to be impacted and changed and even blessed and saved through this man and through his offspring when he doesn't have any offspring? So we, we follow the story, you know, through those chapters of Genesis moving from the end of Genesis 11 through that promise uh, that, that, that's uh, recorded there at the beginning of Genesis chapter 12, 
continuing to put Abram in motion, ultimately taking Abram to Canaan and then kind of back and forth with some trips, uh, trip to Egypt, etc. But, but, but now, this, this is years later, when we have the great visitation, the great advent of the Lord to Abraham. He's now called Abram Abraham, the father of many nations. And Sarai is not just a little princess, a princess to be. She is the princess. That's what her name means, Sarah. She's now called Sarah. But she has no children. And folks, ladies, gentlemen, she's past her cycle. Everything's over now. There is no way. <laughs> she is about 90 years old. And, and even when you take into account, okay, well, sometimes the years and the Genesis and Old Testament seem to be a little bit different. We, we are flat out told in the scripture. Uh, here's the problem. You go back to Genesis 18, 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. I mean, this is even by Genesis standards. They are old, advanced in years, in case you didn't get the message. <laughs> Genesis 18, 11, the first part. And then the second part of verse 11. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Do you hear what is being said? In case you're daft and are missing the point, there is no way humanly, biologically, on the ground, on the earth, possible. Abraham's 99 going on 100. But that's not the problem. I mean, he can still be a father. The big problem is the way of women had ceased with Sarah. Verse 12 of 18. So Sarah laughed to herself. She was kind of polite. She didn't laugh out loud, you know, inside the tent with the Lord being outside and uh, in present form. But she, she laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out. Any of you all worn out? Anybody worn out? When you get to the point of saying, I'm worn out, I'm past the way of women, okay, <laughs> and I'm worn out. Any of you expecting to have a child about that time? Sarah, after I am worn out and my Lord, she's talking about Abraham, is old, shall I now have pleasure? Any of you feel like that? Well, she definitely felt like that. Verse 13. The Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really bear a child when I am old? And then the beginning of verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That is the central question of God's message of the Bible, of faith. If you don't know the answer to that question, the rest of this is not going to make any sense to you. And you're not living in communion with him. This is the central question today for you, for us. I don't know pastor, you know, it's been a pretty hard year. Yeah, I know it's been a hard year. And there are things that we can't understand. I know that. And things seem to keep getting worse instead of better. I know that. So let me ask you this. Where are you on the question? Is anything too hard for God? What do you think? There's certain mountains God can't climb <laughs> after he created them. What do you think? Um, Hayipale, Dave, Dabar, Dabar. The, 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 the Hebrew here, the, the, of this rhetorical question from the Lord God Himself, Dabar means either, well, any of the following thing, cause, or what I would usually translate it as word. Is any word, in other words, is any declaration too hard for God to follow through on? Are there certain things that God can't say and make happen? 
question, right? Some of this, well, you know, pastor, this was kind of poetic and, you know, God came through on, hey, he came through at least on half of the stuff he promises. That kind of where we are, but the rest of it we kind of need to explain away and put out. What do you think? Is any word, any declaration too hard for God to fulfill? Anything that God can't handle? Any cause that God cannot effectuate? Is there any cause that God cannot effectuate? What do you think? Um, the question, the, the, the lead question, the verbal, goes into this question of, is anything, is any difficulty too great for God? Um, the pala there actually could be translated, is any miracle too much for God? Or literally, is there any miracle for God? You ever think about that? I was thinking about that when I was looking at this text. For God, nothing's a miracle, right? Isn't that staggering to think about? It's a miracle for us. But, but, but the word would be, these words would be saying, is there something that God would sit there and say, well, man, that would take a miracle. I have no idea how that would happen. Is there anything like that for God? No, there is no miracle for God because God can do everything. Do you hear what this, this is the rhetorical question? This is what God is laying out for Abraham and for us. It is a rhetorical question. Abraham doesn't need to answer. And thankfully, in this case, Abraham is wise enough not to interrupt God. <laughs> Do you ever interrupt God when he asks you a question? This is a rhetorical question. You know, you know what a rhetorical question is, right? The answer is obvious. So what is the obvious answer to this question? Is anything too hard for God? Is any word too difficult for God to fulfill? What's the answer? No. No. Abraham knows enough not to sit there and interrupt God and say, well, actually, Lord, uh, there may be a few things that you can't pull off. Is that what you do when you kind of talk to God? I know this may be too tough for you, God, but I just kind of wanted to throw it out there in case you might be able to deal with it. Don't know if you can or not. Yahweh continues. Jehovah continues. The Lord continues repeating what he had said earlier. Okay, this is back earlier uh, when he first arrives. At the appointed time, I will return to you. About this time next year. Yep, Abraham, you're going to get a really interesting 100th birthday present. About this time next year, Sarah shall have a son. Abraham doesn't answer, but God does. And he comes through. No surprise there, right, Christian? You go ahead and read about it. It's, a, it's later. There's other stuff that happens. But uh, a year later, uh, Genesis 21, verses 1 through 3, tell us what happened. The Lord visited Sarah. Wait a minute. Yeah, we got another visitation here. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. The power of the Spirit of the Lord brings this miracle about. It's not just that God said, well, you know what, I'll set a few things in motion. It, it, it'll probably happen. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord, you just don't miss that in Genesis 21.1. These words are huge and connect directly with where we're ending up going today and a couple Sundays from now. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. The Lord visits, the Lord intervenes himself. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him. We get the big build up here, right? What's his name going to be? Yitzhak, which means what? Come on, Bible people. What's it mean? Yitzhak. Laughter. Isaac, laughter. Now, you move on in the story, and this, this, this storyline, you know, we get a bunch of chapters on this, so to speak. Isaac, 
the boy, Yitzhak, laughter. He, he later has a wife named Rebecca, who is barren for many years. Just like Sarah was barren. Rebecca is barren. Genesis 25, 21 tells us Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his prayer and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Keep going. Isaac, two sons, right? Jacob, Esau. Jacob's beloved wife, okay? He's got two wives. Remember the story. It's another, another sermon for another day, but he's got two wives. He didn't want two wives. He ends up with two wives. The sisters, Leah and Rachel. Well, Leah is very fruitful, but Rachel, the beloved one, is not for years and years and years. But then God hears her and opens her womb, and she has two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. You keep going in the Old Testament, this, this storyline keeps continuing. You get all the way to Hannah, married to Elkanah, she's barren. And she's at the tabernacle of the Lord at Shiloh, right? And she is crying out to God. And the Lord allows her to have a son. And that son is named Samuel. Shimuel. God hears. God has heard. God repeatedly gives the answer in all kinds of ways to God's rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for me? What's the answer? Come on, folks. What's the answer? Anything too hard for God? No. Is any word or declaration too hard for God to follow through on? No. This is the central creed, at least the axis of the central creed, of the entire Old Testament, of all the Hebrew scriptures. Nothing is too hard for God Almighty. He rules everything. Beyond things you can even begin to imagine. So what about you in your life? Are you living by the creed or not? Do you believe? We come now to Advent. Are you preparing? And let me tell you, central to your preparation is your answer to that question. You want to have a real Christmas? You want to be ready and not be surprised when Jesus returns and <laughs> you are before him face to face? That's going to be majestic, isn't it? You going to be ready? Well, well, central to your preparation, your spiritual preparation, and God's preparing of you, of me, is the answer to this question. What's going on in you? Let me ask you, what's going on in you right now, in your life? Are you in, on fire for the Lord? Are you looking for miracles? Are you seeing miracles? Do you see him at work? I mean, when you talk to him in your prayer life, is it a passionate conversation? And are you pausing and shutting your mouth so that he can give the answer to the question, is anything too hard for me? I know you're concerned about this. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Are you interrupting him and putting him aside or telling him what you need him to do instead of allowing him to be the Lord and God of your life? Where are you this Advent? This is a, a real question, right? If we're going to be serious about Christmas, serious about preparing for his return. It's Advent, the Lord's visitation. What's your attitude spiritually after nine months and more of COVID? And COVID concerns. What's your attitude about that kind of stuff? What's your attitude about finances and the fact that your retirement may not be exactly where it was a year ago? What's your, what's your position on that? What's, what's your spiritual attitude? Um, G.K. Chesterton, in his collection of essays published early in the 20th century, Tremendous Trifles, said this, I love this line, the world will never starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. In other words, there are miracles going on all around you. The question is, do you have eyes to see? Do you have wonder and faith to catch the miracles? 
Chesterton says, the object of my school is to show how many extraordinary things even a lazy and ordinary person, got any lazy and ordinary people among us? <laughs> even a lazy and ordinary person may see if he can spur himself to the single activity of actually looking and seeing. He says, for this purpose, you know, he's got a sense of humor. He says, for this purpose, I have taken the laziest person of my acquaintance, myself, <laughs> and made an idle diary of such odd things as I have fallen over by accident in walking in a very limited area at a very indolent pace. Have you done your journal, your spiritual journal for 2020 yet? Have you noted the miracles yet? I and mean, it's a good time to do it. Like, we're, we're down to the last weeks, and we're, we're getting ready for Christmas and New Year's, right? Even among the laziest among us, can, can we actually, like, remember a few things that God has done in our lives this year? Hmm? He says, the joy of Satan is, is standing on a peak is not a joy in largeness, but a joy in beholding smallness. This is, this is what Satan loves. In fact, that all men, all people look like insects at his feet. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants us to be small and powerless, to not see who God is and not to live in that strength. What's your attitude of mind today for Advent? Well, this brings us to the Annunciation. Luke 1, 26 through 38 is the entire segment of this scripture. We'll return to the larger segment next or a couple of Sundays from now. This is, when I say the Annunciation, what I'm talking about is the message of the archangel Gabriel to Mary and Nazareth. Now look, we're talking about one level of impossibility with Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah, et cetera, et cetera. But if this makes sense, it really kind of is crazy to talk about it. But we're talking about an entirely different level of impossibility when we get to the Annunciation. The bringing forth through fallen mortal flesh. The incarnate coming of the holy, eternal Son of God. We're not talking about just a baby, even a baby of promise and God's covenant promise. We're talking about <laughs> the holy, eternal God incarnate in our mortal flesh through a young teenage maiden virgin Mary. And here comes the Son of God, born as a powerless baby. The infinite became an infant. The infinite became an infant, as Spurgeon says. Is anything too hard for God. Is any word of God going to be broken? 126 of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a, a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Nazareth? Really? I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks. This is just, I mean, it, Nazareth isn't even mentioned in the entire Old Testament. There's a proverbial saying, right, that Nathaniel repeats, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You've got to be joking. Nazareth, yeah, yeah. When God finally decides to bring on the incredible turn of all history, he sends Gabriel to Podunk, never heard from Nazareth, to Mary. Verse 30, Luke 1, 30. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks, but this is a big deal because Luke, who writes very differently, right, than Mark, you spend a lot of time in Mark or Matthew, this is the first time you get the name in Luke's gospel. We've been waiting for it. We've been hearing a lot about Zacharias and Elizabeth and John. Now, finally, we get the name of this one. And he will be great, verse 32, and will be called Son of the Most High. I just mentioned Elizabeth, 
who's another one of these barren women. She picks up on the Old Testament theme, you know, like Sarah, et cetera, all the way through Hannah and beyond, right? Elizabeth is like them. She's barren. By her husband, beyond when it should happen. It's a miracle that it happened. She can't have a child. She's too old. She has a child by her husband, Zacharias. That's a miracle. That's, a, that, that's impossibility, right? But now we're talking about an impossibility at an entirely different level. Again, if you can imagine that, right? Because we're, we're not talking about like, well, you know, um, the Lord is going to, in a couple of years after you follow through with your betrothal to Joseph and you marry him, you're going to have a son by Joseph. This is not what's being discussed here. And Mary knows it. This is not at all what's being discussed. And on top of that, John, when Gabriel goes to Zechariah, he says, hey, he's going to be called great. John is great. As Jesus says, John is the greatest until the coming of the Son of God on earth, the greatest person who ever lived. He's the one who points to the Son of God, greater than Alexander the Great, greater than Moses, etc. All the, I mean, But anyone in the kingdom is greater than John, Jesus says. And what's the turning point? Well, now we're talking about a totally different level of greatness. Yeah, John will be great, but this one is going to be great in the following way. He is the Son of God, not just the prophet of God. The son of God. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? In other words, she gets what is being said to her. It's not like, well, you know what, in a few years it'll kind of work out and we'll, we'll give you a baby by Joseph. No, 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 this is not. And she's asking a question here. She's not refuting this. She's not rejecting this. She's like, ow. Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Back to the Old Testament kind of line of story, verse 36. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. The greatest verses in the Bible. One of the greatest verses in the Bible. You need to know that verse. No word with God will ever fail. It's another way to translate that. That's the way the NIV does. Because rhema in the Greek, same thing as I was telling you with Debar in the Hebrew, it can mean word or thing. No words impossible, no things impossible. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Now, what are we talking about here? We're not talking about name it, claim it. We're not talking about the power of positive thinking. We're not talking about just if you pray it in the name of Jesus, it's going to happen no matter what you snap your fingers and call God to do. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about positive thinking and faith like the guy who jumps off the top of the Empire State Building and at the 50th floor on the way, way down says, so far so good. I think my faith is working. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about putting God to the test or trying to play God ourselves. The most impossible thing, of course, of all is that you would be saved right? Remember from Mark's gospel, as we worked our way through that, the rich young ruler and, and, and Jesus, you know, calls him to real faith and the guy turns away and his disciples are astounded when Jesus says, it's harder for um, a rich man to be saved than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Mark 10, 26, and they were exceedingly astonished and said to them, then who can be saved? Mark 10, 27. Connect this with our key verse for today, 137 of Luke. Mark 10, 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. It's impossible for you to be saved. It's impossible for you to be saved. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. Was it impossible by human standards for the Holy Spirit to come upon a virgin and bring forth the Son of God in the flesh? Yeah. Is it impossible with God? No. Is it impossible for the Holy Spirit of God to bring a new birth in you and me, dead people who are dying in sin and going to be buried in the ground? Yeah, it's impossible for us, right? 
You can't get yourself saved. I got myself saved when I came forward and said the right words. No, 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 friend. You got that reversed. Only by God. It's impossible for a human being to be saved except by the hand of God and the word of God. God himself is the power of bringing fulfillment of all his promises. God is the truth in his word, of his word, for his word. He is the power. He is the truth himself. Augustine says this miracle before us towards which we move to celebrate in this Advent season is incredible. The maker of man became man. The maker of man became man. As Spurgeon puts it, I said it earlier, the infinite became an infant. If we believe in an infinite God, though, here's the thing. We've got to learn to open ourselves to the mystery of his power and to rejoice and believe. This is what Advent is about. This is what this book, this message to you is about. This is what the gospel is about. A sovereign God who moves and saves in his unlimited power. No word, nothing is impossible for him. So my friend, no matter what you think you're facing right now, no matter what challenges you face, not just with COVID, but if the, if the, uh, the diagnosis comes back, it, it's terminal, it's stage four. If your beloved spouse or mom or dad can't even remember your name, if you've lost a child, if you've lost a grandchild, if you can't see how things are going to work out precisely, this is the gospel on which you can stand and be raised up by God forever. God can move through and beyond all the challenges of your life. There is nothing that God calls a miracle. We call it a miracle. He calls it his word fulfilled. Nothing's impossible with God. So let me invite you to come with God and give yourself to him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, as we come before you, we ask that you would move in our lives by your Holy Spirit, Lord, as your Holy Spirit has visited before. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, visit us and bring a faith born of your grace in our hearts for real, a living, powerful, burning, Lord, living faith that we might live in you now and forever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I am delighted uh, for our church family to introduce some of our newest members today, and I want to invite them all to come forward as we introduce them to you. We have coming forward today Andrew Howard and Alta Nicely with their little baby girl, Dally Joe, And we have Chris and Haley Graves with their boys, Thomas and Connor. And we have Dalton and Lindsay Miller with their children, Quinn, their daughter, Quinn, and their son, Connor. So I wanna invite them to come forward. We're thrilled that they've been able to come, even in the challenges of 2020, to come worship with us over the course of this summer and this fall. And now as we move into Advent season, we're delighted to present them as new members of our church. We introduced a few folks a couple weeks ago, and we'll have a couple more to introduce to you, but I wanna give thanks for this great group of folks who are with us today. Uh, so we have the Millers, the Graves, and over here, Andrew and Alta, and little Deli Joe. Yeah, all right. So um, who is your Lord and Savior? All right. And do you promise to continue to follow him through faithful and active membership in our church family here at First Presbyterian? Wonderful. All right. Um, we are blessed to have you with us. We're blessed to hopefully 
our many members who aren't able to be with us in person, you're able to uh, see them, and they all graciously came early for the end of this service. They're all basic, well, actually, two of the three families are 11 o'clock worshipers, but they came early. Thank you guys for playing ball with us, and it's great to introduce you. Uh, let's give thanks to the Lord and rejoice in his good news. And um, actually, uh, I guess as long as we have masks on and we do social distancing outside, it is a beautiful sunny day. If you guys don't mind, just kind of go out on the front steps and let people welcome you after the service. I want to invite you all now to stand and let's sing together the doxology. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.